It's good to see you again, everybody. If you'd like to take your seat, we will get started. Very good. Excellent. I commend you on your timing. You almost made it 10 minutes. <laughs> professor Nuhu Hadibu is a former professor at the University of Sokoi Ine in Tanzania. He's also part of AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. I love titles that just say exactly what you are aiming to do. So I said, what are you going to talk to us about, Professor? And he says, the technology that will help solve all the problems that we've heard in the first chunk of this morning, solutions, tech solutions, but really focusing on young people, because not young, enough young people in Africa want to be farmers or involved in agriculture. It's not cool. It's not sexy. He didn't say that bit. That's me ad-libbing. But with tech, maybe that might be the way to draw young people in. Professor, looking forward to hearing from you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. OK, so can we get it to start? Just, just click it. Nothing is coming on. OK. Now, because we've got very little time, I start with my recommendations. Uh, so, because uh, a lot of things have been discussed, and we, I, when I look at this room, I know half of the people we have been talking about these things for a very long time. One of the, the most important things that is said this morning is our policies and the strategies. They've moved away from being irrigation smart. We need to rediscover that. Because if irrigation is not part of the long-term vision of a country, and the long-term vision about food security, the long-term vision about sustainability, and especially the long-term vision about employment of the youth, then is not going to be implemented. So we really need to push for irrigation smart policies in our countries. Now, we also need to integrate farmer uh, high in, with, with the farming high-tech irrigation. And the most critical, which has been said here, is how do we integrate it with the agricultural value change in order to have profit motives drive the adoption, adaptation and adoption. It's very, very critical to look at profit motives. One of the big mistakes that we make when we talk about private sector, we talk about big companies like PepsiCo. But smallholders, for example, in Africa, when they are put together, they are the largest private sector around. We need to consider them as a private sector. They are profit-driven. And it is if we can engage them and ensure that the technology, that you, the high tech that we bring can link them effectively to the profitable markets, then you can actually stay aside and things will drive themselves. Our biggest area of investment, therefore, in order to get these high tech technologies to be available, adapted, affordable, and leading to profit is to invest in high, uh, in R&D for these technologies, especially R&D that is connected to the private sector. And again, not the large private sector, the SMEs that you find in Africa and South Asia. They need to drive the development of this technology. And we've got examples that shows that this can actually be done with the small and medium-sized enterprises. Schengen showed this uh, 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 slide earlier, but I'm repeating it because there is a point I want to make. Africa is behind in irrigation development today, but actually that is a good thing. We did not waste our money to do the wrong irrigation systems. <laughs> so now we can learn from all the mistakes that these other guys have made and actually use our money in modern high-tech irrigation systems. This is exactly what happened with mobile telephone and mobile money. Africa is today the leader in the world in terms of mobile money. Why did it happen? Because when mobile money was discovered in Africa, there was nobody with a checkbook that was acceptable. Nobody had accounts. 
Nobody could transfer money with a credit card. Therefore, mobile telephone, which is the best technology anyway, now became the technology for money transfer and money management and payments, and we are leading the world. We will equally lead the world with the new technology in irrigation, which I'm going to talk about today. So being behind is, a pro is not a problem, it's an advantage. The other thing that I want to make uh, emphasize here is it's not really about irrigation. It is about getting adequate amount of water into the soil and in ways that the crop can actually pick it and use it. So in many cases, actually, you need supplementary irrigation because you already got plenty of water that you get free of charge from rain. And if your soil is well managed and can store and reserve that water, the amount of irrigation that you need is actually very little. In Tanzania, for example, at the moment, we have discovered that one of our major problems is not actually rain, is actually soil acidity. The roots are too short, they cannot pick any amount of water you put into it, whether it is from rain or from irrigation. So what we're emphasizing here, irrigation must be part and parcel of a, an ecosystem of improved technologies and inputs for crop production. Not on it alone, or not being left out. It must be part and parcel of a, an integrated system. So going back to my subject, rainwater harvesting therefore and storage is very critical because again, we have enough water in many, uh, enough rain actually in many places, but the problem of course it comes within a very short period. It's not like in Europe or America where your rainfall is actually drip irrigation. Our rainfall is not drip irrigation, it comes whole year rainfall in three, four days. Can you harvest, store it, and then use pumps together with the uh, groundwater systems to lift this water and then apply it for your crop. Especially, again, I want to emphasize for supplementary irrigation. Now, combining this with technology such as drip irrigation and ICT and control sensors to increase the precision of application of that water to the extent that you actually use the minimum amount of water for maximum uh, crop uh, performance. This is the area which I'm talking about. These technologies are known. These technologies are there, especially ICT technologies, and we are using them for many things. We already start to use them for irrigation, in precision planning, in uh, scheduling irrigation, and if that is increased and it is put on the hand of smallholders, who, as I said earlier, by the way they've taken up mobile money in Africa, they are ready and hungry for that kind of technologies, I think you can see huge changes happening. And my favorite is solar-powered pumps. I believe this is the frontier of next development, big development in the irrigation systems. First of all, you can put it anywhere, where there is sun, and we've got, me coming from Africa, we've got plenty of that. Uh, uh, and and it, it, it can solve a lot of problems. Research in Egypt are showing that solar-powered pumps, even when you, you take the high capital costs, actually are better than diesel-powered pumps in, in, in terms of cost of energy. So this area, and, and, and I want to use now, solar-powered pumps are very attractive to the youth. And, and therefore, it is a way of attracting the youth to come into a But the most important is the ability to actually apply it nearly everywhere. It doesn't matter what kind of terrain you have. As long as you, you work out the, what is the source of water. And most of it could, could come from rainwater harvesting and storage as well as groundwater. But what do we do with the high capital costs? To be frank, nothing, because it will come down if we support high level research and development, as we've done for the ICTs and mobile system, it will actually come down. But of course, we need to increase R&D, supporting the R&D. We need to expand local manufacturing, because that actually, and supply system, you create a supply chain, and after sales service, then the, the whole technology is not just affordable, but then it's actually been operated and maintained uh, properly. Good. But, Initially, before the capital costs come down, the, you can come up with innovative financing system. And one we've, we've tried is lease financing, where the equipment itself is the collateral for the loans that they're given. And this actually can support widespread uptake of these technologies. 
which brings us back to my recommendation. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor, go back, go back up there. As I was walking down here, somebody said, wow. Not just for the content, but because you were so succinct. That was great. You made my day. Uh, when did you know that you loved agriculture? What was that moment? Stand here in front of the microphone. What, what was that moment where you were like, I know, I love it, this is my life. I will lecture about it one day at the World Bank. I know I did not love it. <laughs> when I was young... Uh, this is a short anecdote, by the way. Yeah, Professor. when I was young... We used to walk from highlands areas where I was born to the lowlands to grow maize. And then we, to, we had to carry it up the mountains back to the house. And I used to walk behind my mother and throwing the, the maize cobs away to reduce the weight that I'm carrying. By the time I got home, actually, I was carrying half of the load. So I really did not like agriculture that much. But what, what motivated me to like rainwater harvesting is because the water that we were following in the lowlands actually came from the highlands. So I said, why don't you harvest this water and grow this crop here? That's when I started with rainwater harvesting. Excellent presentation, excellent story. Thank you. <laughs> Professor. Martha Mamo is your next moderator. Martha, bring your panel on stage. We'd love to see them. Welcome, panel. Come up on stage. So this session is high tech for inclusive growth. You're about to meet the panelists. And let me tell you a little bit about Martha. Martha Mamo is Professor of Agronomy at Nebraska and Lincoln University. I'm going to hand over to her. And that's a tough story to follow, but I know you have one. Take a seat, everybody. Very good. Where do you want to sit, Martha? You're in charge. All right. You sit there. Pick up the microphone. Tell us your story. And we're looking forward to your panel. Good morning. I'm Martha Mamo, again, uh, Professor of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, it's a pleasure to moderate this session. I'm particularly interested in farmer-led uh, small-scale irrigation. Um, I want to kind of give you some ideas of how we will do this panel discussion. Um, each of the panelists will give an introduction. Um, brief introduction, and then uh, I'll bring it back and provide uh, some um, questions to them. Um, and then following that, we would open it up for the uh, Q&A for the audience. Uh, so please prepare your questions. And uh, I know we lost some time in the previous session, uh, so we'll, we'll have um, that opportunity for the audience to ask questions. So today we have um, several great panelists that will uh, focus on um, low-tech, small-scale irrigation, farmer-led, so boots on the ground. What we really want to hear today is what examples, what efforts, what challenges have been made on the ground. So far, we've listened about broad issues and factors influencing um, production in sub-Saharan Africa, and in particular, small-scale irrigation. So I hope to hear some details about efforts going on in, in parts of Africa. Uh, we've also heard a few notable items today, this morning. One, irrigation alone is not a standalone technology. That's not the only thing that's needed uh, to increase intensification. Um, in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, we heard that less than 10 million hectares are irrigated. But most importantly, 70% of the sub-Saharan African farmers are smallholder farmers. So this Mickey Mouse irrigation or uh, small-scale irrigation is very critical for um, intensification, uh, ecological intensification of production to meet uh, food demand, nutrition, reduce hunger, as uh, was mentioned earlier. So we'll start off with the introduction. We've got Richard Berklin. Uh, who will uh, give us his introduction. Uh, then we have Christopher Neely uh, from the uh, Doherty Water for Food Institute at UNL. Uh, Timothy Pruitt, way in the, the very end. Uh, he's a CEO for International Development Enterprise, or IDE. Uh, Elizabeth Nisamada, uh, we heard from her earlier. Uh, she's the president of Eastern Africa Farmers. Um, David Ferguson couldn't be here with us today. Um, uh, and then we have uh, Linda Kwambako, uh, founder of MFARM. 
So we'll get started with a brief introduction and uh, Richard will have you get started. Well, if you've noticed, there seems to be a strong connection between irrigation and Nebraska. And previous speakers have mentioned that Nebraska is the epicenter of irrigation in the United States, being the largest irrigated state. Um, about 44 years ago, I started a career at Valmont Irrigation. And I always had a love for international travel. And uh, so early in my career, I was sent out in the world to spread the gospel about pivot technology. And one of those areas was Africa. And uh, at the time, the only commercial agricultural sector was probably South Africa. And uh, it was easy to spread this gospel in South Africa, and uh, where we've sold over 22,000 pivots. Uh, but it became harder in the rest of Africa because it was dominated by smallholder Afri uh, farmers. Um, and it served only probably 1% of the farmers, which were, which were commercial farmers. But I always felt a little uneasy about the smallholder farmers because this technology couldn't serve them. So after this career, I began to think, how can we um, introduce this technology to smallholder farmers? And uh, all through my career, I tried to make small pivots for small farmers. The problem was, as we're working against mathematics, and I'll try to explain that in the uh, next slides, but there's no solution to poverty unless you put more money in the pockets of these farmers. And the only way you can do that is to make them into commercial farmers. So I want to explain the circles concept. It's not just giving one element to the farmers like good fertilizer or hybrids or market channels, but it's a comprehensive program of four elements. It's modern technology, starting with irrigation, it's seeds, tillage, mechanization, and pest control. But it's also financing, just like the commercial farmers have. It's market linkage to a market. It doesn't do any good to produce a lot of product if you can't sell it. And it's also institutional support and, monet and mentoring. But why large center pivots? Uh, why first center pivots? and why large center pivots? Center pivots because it's the most economical way to irrigate in scale. Um, it's also a foundation uh, to assemble a, a cooperative of farmers. It's a visible thing in the field uh, to actually be the foundation for a cooperative. Now this kind of explains that pivots are kind of unique in the irrigation field. It's the only irrigation that's in a circle. Therefore, it benefits from pi r square. The pivot is a radius, and when it gets larger, you benefit from pi and square. So the larger the pivot, the more economical it is per unit of area. This graph kind of shows it uh, pretty dramatically, and that's why most of the pivots you see from the air are 50 hectare units. I'm getting the signal to go quicker. This shows uh, how many pivots have been sold in Africa and how many are in operation. There's about 35,000 pivots in Africa in operation. Uh, this is an interesting slide. This is the first pivot I sold in Kenya. And it shows what a farmer did uh, by engaging small farmers and leasing out pie sections of that pivot uh, and providing an irrigation service. Liebig's Law, 
and that really applies to African agriculture. It's not so, so much how many resources you have, it's the least resource that's important, and that's what controls growth. And in Africa, it's not a problem with physical water scarcity. It's an economic water scarcity. This is how a pivot is divided up into sections, and each one of those pie sections can be, have different water applications. But you can also use, use the pump for multiple usage for pastoralists and for domestic water supply. This is what a wash facility will what look like. I don't have to talk about this. Again, the four elements are necessary for success. Thank you. Good morning. So uh, I'm going to uh, present uh, an example, uh, an example in Ethiopia where um, the water for food and uh, UNL and invested some seed money on uh, a project uh, led by a team from uh, UNL and, and uh, Ethiopia universities uh, in two different locations um, where a country which uh, we've already heard today uh, has challenges and lots going on, um, but typically uh, in many uh, areas in sub-Saharan Africa, you might have the land and the, and the water resources, uh, but the layout or the terrain or the relief are not conducive for large-scale uh, irrigation schemes. Um, Typically, uh, in uh, this case of Eastern Ethiopia, uh, large uh, open wells were dug to get to the water table and to uh, lift water out for, for irrigation. Uh, the group of researchers uh, collaborating with IDE um, in, in, uh, introduced uh, shallow groundwater uh, mapping, uh, tre treadle pumps, and shallow wells. Uh, and trained uh, the farmers uh, on how to dig these wells and conduct the maintenance. Um, the point here is that after uh, successfully installing these and operating them for uh, a while, some entrepreneurial farmers uh, uh, decided that um, maybe they could use the well and introduce a different type of pumping system to uh, facilitate lifting water. And so uh, some entrepreneurial farmers uh, created a business around this and in um, using what they learned from the original intervention uh, on well creation and well development to uh, uh, use the wells then for uh, small pumps, in this case small gasoline pumps, but one can imagine that uh, solar pumps could be used as well, as we've heard uh, that as part of the discussion. So um, uh, f farmers uh, uh, learned how to uh, do the wells, and then they moved on and, and, and introduced uh, an added benefit. And we can imagine now with solar pumps that that could expand even further. Uh, with a lower cost of energy, but I want to point out that uh, we've got to be concerned about the unintended consequences, right, um, of uh, solar pumps perhaps or cheap energy, as we've seen examples uh, in India of uh, what uh, cheap energy can uh, uh, do to groundwater resources. So we've got to uh, pay attention to uh, the sustainability of the system and the governance uh, of this common resources, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd already been introduced, but uh, once again, 
Uh, my name is Elizabeth Nsimadala. I'm a smallholder model youth farmer from southwestern part of Uganda. And I'm the president of Eastern Africa Farmers Federation. I also sit on the board of a Pan-Africa Farmers Organization. Uh, talking about the Eastern region, I'm, I'm looking at uh, a constituency of over 20 million smallholder farmers that we represent under our regional network. And uh, speaking from uh, a farmer perspective, a majority of you may not understand what we go through as farmers when we are talking of, uh, you know, high-tech technologies. Uh, my experience with um, irrigation systems, uh, like you can see on the screens, I'm even cautioning you before I can go there. It's not in any way, what I'm presenting is not what I may call high-tech, but these are solutions that provide uh, what we call immediate solutions to the smallholder farmers. Uh, one of those photos uh, is an, in, is a, an open water canal irrigation system. This is a case of Doho irrigation scheme in Uganda. And the next photo too uh, clearly explains what we call uh, open canal and how, how it is done in Uganda or the Eastern region. Uh, when we talk of drip irrigation, I'm now giving you a clear picture of what we go through as farmers. If there are any farmers in this house, you know what I mean. A situation whereby the farmers don't have even the money to invest in an irrigation system. That is exactly what we go through. And um, that photo, is that is my, my president, the president of Uganda. If some of you know him, he was demonstrating on the youth of uh, bottle irrigation. So this is where I now challenge even the political leaders. Where is the goodwill? Because if the heads of states themselves can demonstrate such, then where do we see the goodwill of uh, you know, investing in, uh, in the irrigation system? So this now calls upon all the different partners to really um, work together and make sure that uh, we support the smallholder farmers who is the most affected when it comes to the agriculture sector. That is the rain gun irrigation. Uh, these are now the high tech that we as farmer organizations are now bringing cross to our people. That is why I'm now, uh, that this is the reason I'm saying that um, uh, farmer organizations have come in to bridge the gap of what uh, the public has really failed to do. Uh, that is a horse reel irrigation. It is uh, powered by solar, and at times we, we use the motorcycle engines, and that is water harvesting. Um, we believe as farmer organizations that together we stand. And uh, once we divide ourselves, then we are likely to fall. So I'm calling upon all the partners. Uh, the region where I come from, when it comes to embracing irrigation, uh, the uptake has been at a lower level. Uh, so it is, um, it is still an area where you can invest. And so we are open as Eastern Africa Farmers Federation for partnerships and uh, I had already a screenshot of our website. You can visit our, our website, and uh, we are available to work with you. Thank you very much. I 
guess I have to wait my, for my presentation to be put up. <laughs> uh, cool. So five minutes seems like a short time, but when I was putting this presentation together, I felt five minutes is a lot of time. And like the rest of the panelists, I've never, I've not focused on irrigation as the main thing or the main solution that I provide to the farmers. But I've realized, um, well, uh, as I was introduced, my name is Linda and I work with farmers. I connect them to markets through uh, a platform called MFarm Limited or MFarm, really. So here we have a, a crop of a snow pea. And um, we had a really huge order from exporters and they wanted farmers to be able to supply this crop. So um, when we put out the request to the farmers, there were so many of them who were willing to fulfill the order. But uh, one of the key things that we realized with export products or horticulture is that they're very uh, resource demanding. And one of the huge resources is water. So when we went down to the field, we saw that this is how the farmers actually go about doing their irrigation. So they have the pods, they'll do the money maker. I don't know how many of you have heard of the money maker pump, right? Then um, over here, I have two photos. So on the left is one of the farmers who participated in fulfilling the snow pea order. And on the right, uh, we have the manual way in which we were mapping water availability and accessibility. We literally had to take photos of the farmers standing in their field, and then we will take the longitudes and the latitudes, if you can see on row three and four, or yeah, row four and five. We had to use that, put it in our database, and identify how much hectares of land we have in total for the crop to be for water to be available to produce the crop so all in all we had to map who has the pod who has the well and who's using probably water and pumping it from the riverside and uh, from there we started doing a bit of research and we realized that um, the government is putting in a lot of effort in Kenya and so far there is 2.9 million hectares under production in Kenya, and only 4% of it is under irrigation, which makes 3% of the GDP in Kenya. And if you look at it overall, 18, it, it uh, contributes to 18% of the value of all agricultural produce. That is irrigation in Kenya. Now, um, uh, 3.5... Um, <clears throat> 3.5 million hectares is a projection that the government um, wants to expand its uh, production or productivity in, in Kenya. And only 440,800 hec 440, hectares are supposedly uh, to be under irrigation. And that will be only 25%. Uh, and remember, 60, 60, 65 to 75% of uh, land in the rural area is, of course, smallholder farmers. And 80% and of the smallholder farmers are women um, um, fo focused. So there's a, it's very labor intensive. There's a lot of time that is consumed. And as we know, most of the women farmers have to tend to their families. They have to make sure that they are managing the workers in the field. So in partnership with Strathmore University, we started up a research um, to see how we can put together some sort of a water management system. So um, what we have here is a kit that alerts the farmers at the right um, of the moisture levels in the water and also on the crops and uh, alerts them on the amount of water they need to harvest so that they can be able to fulfill a certain amount of crop. And um, so what we have done, we've tried this experiment with farmers who already have tanks and they've harvested their water. Five minutes is a very short time. <laughs> so we've tried, um, we've, we've installed a few of the prototypes in the fields. And basically this is supposed to tell the farm of the water levels and uh, automate the irrigation. And then secondly, we have a pipe and the technologies fit into the pipe and we can be able to tell how much water has been used for irrigation. And also 
uh, inform the form of the water level. So we, we are basically at prototype level. But the reason why we are doing and participating in these technologies is because we realize there's a lot of time that is wasted. You First of all, a farmer has to employ labor, which is not easily available in as much as we hear in Kenya, the youths don't have jobs. But when it's, have, when it's harvesting and planting season, that labor is really scarce because all it, it's either they are competing for higher paying um, manual jobs or probably the youth have gone to the cities trying to look for these other kinds of jobs. But if we look at making irrigation smart, we, we say it means we're going to put more time in the hands of women. And it also means that there'll be enough time to specialize in skill development. The youth who's fetching water with a bucket to uh, pour into the field or to irrigate the crops, can specialize in distributing irrigation equipment or specialize in value addition or even distribution of the food in itself. So how are we making irrigation systems smarter in such a way that first of all, we, we utilize the water that we have efficiently and then secondly, we use our time um, smartly in collecting the right data to understand what nutrition is required, what amounts of water is required for which kind of value chain or which kind of crop. Um, so basically, we'll be having a discussion, and that's me, and yeah, let's continue. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, and to the organizers. It's really great to be here and to, to see so many, many friends and some new faces as well. So I'm, I'm Tim Pruitt. I'm the CEO of IDE. Uh, and I'm a chief enthusiast of Mickey Mouse Farming. Thank you, Dr. Ringler, for introducing Mickey Mouse Farming to us today. That's a, uh, <laughs> it's a great one. So um, uh, let me give you a very quick snapshot of IDE. We were founded 35 years ago. And in Somalia, our first effort was a social enterprise. Back then, we called it a business. We had a, a fundamental belief that the way you solve poverty was actually through the entrepreneurs, the farmers, and people that would drive the effort and, and work themselves out of poverty and make a better life uh, for their family. However, they need tools, they need technologies, they need the right systems and infrastructure to get that done. And, and so far, in our 35-year journey, we've reached 30 million people with a product or a service that's had a tangible impact on their lives. So not only is it a, is it a belief, but it also makes economic sense. Um, we sell things like water pumps, drip irrigation kits, latrines, water filters. We have systems that sell seed and fertilizer. Uh, we're in 14 countries and have about 1,000 employees. So by far, the most difficult part of our work and the challenge that we, we accept on a daily basis is to reach scale. That is the fundamental effort that we're engaged in, and it's, it's, it is very important to us. And so I'll share a quick story about, share about scaling drip irrigation. So far, we've sold about 100,000 of these kits in several countries. Um, and the question we're asking is, how do we reach a million people with this technology? And how do we make it better and more accessible and reach more farms? Um, and this is the goal, a farmer that is working her land, that is growing nutritious food, that is saving water. It's a climate smart technology. There are, are a lot of advantage, advantages to this. I don't think I need to speak too much to this group about that. We found when we did a, a survey uh, of companies and and our farmers that they got as much as 70% of increased yield uh, and they, they got water savings, I'm sorry, water savings as much as 70% and increased yield almost to, to double, 90% in some cases. It depends of course upon the crop and the land and so many other variables, but you, you definitely get a boost. You also get less use of fertilizer and pesticides because you're putting water right at the root. Now, there's not all good news because actually, you might ask yourself, why aren't these products all over the world, right? I've seen it in Israel, in Argentina, of course here in the US, and in about a dozen African nations, and you have to say to yourself, well, why, why aren't farmers buying this already? And so we went to the, the, the world's experts on this, the companies that manufacture, as well as our own staff and groups from around the world to say, 
What's holding back mass purchase of drip irrigation? How do we unlock the market so that more farmers can access this technology? And I'll just share three of those findings uh, with you today in the, in the interest of time. First is that the number one driver of why farmers buy a product such as drip irrigation is be its peer influence. So if they have a support group, if they have a neighbor that's using it effectively already, that is the single greatest driver to upgrade the farm. The second one, and this, is, this was very interesting to us, farmers, smallholder farmers when interviewed, they found that drip irrigation would give them less labor time, more time um, to do other things, and, and they did see um, the water savings, but they did not see increase in crop quality or crop yield, even though that's a very common attribute to using drip irrigation. So that the full benefits of the product were not understood. And the third, and this is huge, and this is part of our, our history at IDE, um, we worked with a lot of companies designing products for the developing world, and usually they follow all of our advice except one, price. The lower you can get the price, the more accessible it's going to be. And then subsequently, if you can offer financing, that's when you see the sales really take off. We found in a randomized control trial with one of our other products that customers were four times as likely to buy the product if they had financing available at the point. I'm getting a very knowing nod from Lacey, so I need to finish up here. You know, I think one of the things about African agriculture, since we're talking about Africa today, um, I think that it's important to recognize how far African agriculture has already come. Because if we were having this conversation uh, 20 years ago, technologies and reaching scale kind of weren't on the table the way they are today. And I, I think there's a, there's a lot of accomplishment, there's a lot of growth. Um, of, of course we want to see that growth faster, we want to see more scale. That would benefit not only the people of Africa, but the world. Because the, the, as we heard from the opening comments, the, the food that we need to feed this planet, uh, it's, it's, an, it's a daunting challenge. And, and I'm optimistic that over time we can employ not only drip irrigation, but several other technologies. Uh, to bring us there. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, panelists, uh, for a great introduction. I think you gave us some good examples of ongoing activities on the ground. Um, my first uh, question, some of the questions were addressed through your um, introduction, but uh, my first question is, um, as these uh, smart technology, irrigation technology, have been implemented, what factors were considered uh, in implementation? For example, uh, input from the smallholder farmers, uh, communities, and other factors that were considered. If you could, uh, any panelists could give us an example of what was considered as these technologies were implemented in these specific areas. Uh, thank you very much, Martha. Uh, talking from our own experience, uh, in the morning I shared uh, a case where we lost um, part of the um, the main Kenya lost almost 95% uh, of the produce. Uh, luck enough, our farmers were insured because we have uh, uh, a working memorandum of understanding with insurance companies. It's that loss that our farmers faced that really triggered the uptake of irrigation. And uh, that's when we had to work out an understanding with uh, an irrigation company, Cool Cup, which is offering irrigation services to our farmers on a long-term uh, financing basis that is tagged to production. So there is always um, a crisis. As Africans, we believe to act, there has to be a crisis. So it is that crisis that really uh, led to the uptake of the 
of the technologies, of the irrigation technologies. Thank you. Anyone else want to add or expand? Okay, uh, I will talk about uh, commercial value as one of the incentives as to why some of these technologies will be adopted. Because um, we realized when we're taking the market to the farmers and we're telling them, look, there is a market for snow peas. If you can be able to fulfill 200 tons of snow peas per week, please come on board and sell your produce. So most of the farmers who did not have a well or did not put up a pond or did not put up a, a dam or a temporary dam were very motivated to set up water systems and just to adhere to global gap uh, or global good agricultural practices. So the, motivate, the motivation that I have seen from my end is the commercial value. So what, how much money are they able to put into their pockets? Because they can produce as much as they, you know, you can produce as much food, but if you're going to lose it either to uh, pest diseases or lack of um, channels to which you're able to distribute it, then um, they do not see the benefit. But also I agree with Tim on peer influence. Because once they've seen a farmer has successfully sold, let me give you an example. So we had a whole um, host of crops that the exporter wanted to purchase. They wanted to purchase the snow peas, sugar snaps, and garden peas. So there was a lot of money that was made from the garden peas, unlike the, sh the snow peas that we introduced. One farmer was able to expand their farm from quarter of an acre to two acres because he had statements of transaction from M Farm and was able to go to an institution, a financial institution, which by the way, it's not the big banks who, well, they, they will communicate and they will always appear to have packages or financial products for farmers. It was a very small bank. It was called Paramount Bank actually um, in Rift Valley. So this farmer was able to apply for a loan of 500,000 Kenyan shillings, but he was only financed at 300, 350,000 shillings. But what assisted him was the transactions he had done for two seasons from the same project. And b because of that, other farmers were able to join the bandwagon and produce more and invest more um, in, their, in their agribusiness. So I believe it's the commercial value in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we are, are getting close to the end, but uh, I would like uh, to give uh, the audience an opportunity to ask questions if there are any questions. Please raise your hand and uh, we can go from there. Any question for the panelists? Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question is to Mr. Tim about the financing. Uh, actually, I'm Gagandeep Singh Bedi. I'm from India. Uh, uh, I just want to ask your views about the financing of the micro irrigation because my personal view is that micro irrigation if it is done for say uh, the crops like vegetables or floriculture etc it's it can be quite expensive and if the even if the finances were arranged for the farmers through the financial institutions uh, the farmer may end up with a lot of uh, like uh, installments heavy installments to be paid for example, in India, about an acre of land may cost about $1,500 if in, in Indian currency it is seen. So my question to you is whether it, by financing you mean uh, the financing through the banking institutions or you feel that part financing or subsidizing through the governments should also be done? Thank you, great question. And I'm, I, I would say both have a positive impact, uh, but recognize that uh, sometimes farmers can get into arrangements with banks that they struggle to maintain. So I think for um, banks, it's important to, we're not a bank, by the way, we're, we're, we're on the product end, but banks need to m maintain the integrity to review the, the loan application and to ensure that it would come back positively. And of course, we have a number of uh, instances where crops have failed hugely and the bank's underwater, and that's where insurance comes in. Well, not all countries have insurance systems set up. So I think w uh, what you're pointing to is really a fundamental issue uh, of the challenge. Why isn't there more financing? Well, there's layers there. 
I think for us, I can speak to our success, which has been largely through partnering with local banks. Uh, local banks in Ghana, for example, local banks like Vision Fund or Kiva.org, global banks with local branches. Uh, that has, has worked for us, and we have a more than a 99% repayment rate on our products. Um, the other aspect of it, which I think is probably the most fertile ground for development of drip irrigation, are the schemes in India that the Indian government has done to promote drip irrigation through a partial, I call it a smart subsidy. Nobody who loves markets likes to talk subsidies, right? But this is a really smart subsidy that subsidizes production, not consumption. So you saw a lot of uptake. Uh, and I think the example of onions in India, which although had some, some water issues with it, regardless, I think was a great example of widespread adoption of this technology. And there's a ton of learnings there. So thank you for your, your question, thanks. Other questions? with the mouth. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Quick question for Tim also. Your 90% increase in yields with drip irrigation, is that compared to what? Is that compared to no irrigation to drip irrigation or is it compared to hose pipe irrigation or sprinkler irrigation? What's the baseline there? That's a 30 to 90% increase and that was reported by the farmers in the survey. So yeah. that's not, that was not a scientific yield survey, but rather feedback from customers. All but the data you saw here was, a, was market research. But what was the baseline? Was it irrigated or non-irrigated? Uh, I'd have to look. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an important question because obviously going from non-irrigated to irrigated, you get two times a yield, three times a yield all the time. But it's going from one kind of irrigation to drip irrigation, much lower percentages of increase. Yeah, it's a good so point. Thank you. Hello, okay. My question's for Linda. I was wondering if you could provide some more details about the water kits and how they're designed and how the farmers go about maintaining them afterwards. Um, they look kind of technologically complicated and especially for illiterate women farmers, how they interact with the system. Thank you. Um, so fast direct prototype stage. So we're putting it out there to see how we can be able to monitor um, moisture level um, a lot to the farmers. So it's literally, we, it's, uh, there's an end to the kit that is pitched to the soil, and the other end is also to the water storage so that you're able to monitor how does the soil look like? Are we alerting the farmer on their phone that they need to water? And how many cubic meters do they need to, put, to open up for and you know, regulate the water? So we have not made it user friendly so no user experience really has been put into account, but it's at prototype stage. Only 100 farmers actually have been have these gadgets distributed to. So we're yet developing, we're developing it. Yes. Back. Yes, uh, my question is mainly for uh, Valmont and for IDE. Uh, introducing drip irrigation and central pivot is something, but the question is uh, how do you ensure the continuous operation and maintenance after you leave? And for how long do you establish local uh, capacity, local experience, and how this is works, you know, because I saw a lot of systems they installed, but they are not working after some time. Thank you. Okay, I can speak for the center pivot industry. Uh, we first introduced center pivots in South Africa in the early 70s. And so we've had 40 to 50 years of time to establish a dealer network and technicians throughout Africa. Um, primarily in South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, uh, Kenya, Egypt, uh, places like that. So we can leverage that technical expertise for the small farmer because this technical service is available locally. So that's what we intend to do. Great question. And I think if you look at the drip irrigation systems 
in here, here in the US, in California, or in Israel, you can see drip irrigation lasting like some lines will last 10 years or so. It's a really durable product. The main problem with drip irrigation in the developing world is that if the water is not filtered before going in, it may very well clog the system. And so the, the, we, several years ago, invented a drip irrigation kit which had a very easy to clean uh, system, a little tube you pull out and you blow through it and you, you, know, you just clear it out. And that had some, some leverage, it had some adoptability, it did, it did fairly well. But I think on the whole, you can't, you, you don't see drip irrigation kits right now lasting beyond two or three seasons. And I think there's a, there's a number of reasons for that. But the lack of technicians that are able to troubleshoot the problems are significant. And that's why when you look at the most successful example of smallholder farmers adopting drip irrigation, they're usually in a cluster like in India with onions. Once you get a cluster, you get a, it's not highly specialized knowledge, but you get a few technicians naturally emerging out of that that can help. The costs otherwise are just too much to service farmers uh, that are few and far between. The second thing, and this is related to the comment about peers as well, oftentimes a lead farmer that knows the product very, very well, we use a system called Farm Business Advisor, which is a commission-based system, those individuals can go in and service uh, the, the drip irrigation to limited effect. But it remains one of the biggest challenges with widespread adoption. I can't tell you how many, you, know, you want to talk about seeing failures. I mean, you can see it with all kinds of water pumps and technologies around Africa. And if I see another standpipe that doesn't work, I mean, it, it's just absurd. But with drip irrigation, I mean, I've seen the lines used to tie up cows and for fencing and, you know, I, it just, it doesn't have the same level of durability without that technical expertise. So getting the critical mass to service it is absolutely where this needs to go. Great question. Well, uh, thank you panelists. Uh, in the interest of time, we will uh, close off the Q&A session. And uh, I just want to recap a few things that were mentioned uh, today uh, on uh, smart irrigation technology. The concepts of uh, uh, um, circle concepts were highlighted, and that's a framework. Um, we'll, we'll wait for the uh, output and impact of that uh, concept. Uh, we talked about a uh, different type of small-scale irrigation, including the shallow well, that is a technology of IDE. Um, others uh, that were mentioned included uh, the drip irrigation system using the bottle, uh, rain gun irrigation, horse reel irrigation, and then uh, Linda provided some information, which is sort of a backward way where you first uh, identify the market for a particular product, and then you recruit farmers to use these specific technology. And um, so that's one key way of ensuring adoption of uh, irrigation systems. Um, and then there were some challenges uh, discussed related to uh, adoption of drip irrigation uh, that Tim mentioned. Um, so I know we didn't talk a lot about the challenges and failures of some of these uh, systems. Uh, so I encourage um, audience member to reach out to the panelists and uh, ask them specific questions um, uh, later on um, so we can uh, have an ongoing discussion and be thinking about uh, going forward, uh, what are solutions, what are key elements that we need to consider as we promote small scale irrigation. Uh, with that, I would like to thank the uh, World Bank, the organizers, and um, the audience for uh, patiently listening and for the panelists uh, who provided some insightful ideas, but also information on their efforts uh, that are going on. Thank you. Thanks, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, panel. You can file off this way very elegantly. Um, in 25 minutes time, we are going to have a lunch program. In order to have the lunch program, you need to have lunch. So these are my instructions. You go out there, you will encounter lunch, you will pick whatever you want, bring it back to your table. Not complicated. You do not have to sit with the same people you've been sitting with all morning. 
change it up a little bit if you want to. If you really like them, come back to the exact same spot. So the program continues in 25 minutes time when you'll be eating and listening to the lunchtime program. Enjoy lunch, don't eat it all. I haven't had breakfast yet. Save me a little bit. See you soon.